So, um, I'm Geordie. For those of you who don't know me and looking around the room, it's just filled with lovely people. I do oh, know. No, there's two readers here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it is my great pleasure tonight to launch off into the void um, James Bradley's new novel. It's one of those um, strange and, and sad experiences when you read a book and you think, I would love to celebrate this as an aesthetic artifact, as a beautifully written book, which shows how, and I should backtrack and say that over the years, James and I have had many conversations. Uh, it, I think it's an act of kind of mutual self-soothing where we say basically, <laughs> Have you noticed in the paper today, we're all going to die? <laughs> and he says, yes, I saw that. Have you other, seen this other piece that says we're going to die even sooner? <laughs> Ooh, we say, and get off the phone, you feel better <laughs> about yourself for a little while. But the interesting thing is that for the rest of us mortals, you have these conversations and they are the kind of social conversational glaze but when you get the book, when you read the novel and you see what novelists can do that the rest of us cannot, is that beneath the glaze there is something solid and dense and rich and grained. A kind of consciousness of the larger architecture of story, a sense of the issues at stake that goes beyond the kind of banal, chatty conversation, a sense of empathy and a sense that one might enter into the minds and lives of others who do not exist to inhabit them, to ventriloquize effectively and beautifully and to draw you out of your own solipsism for a moment for an hour or five and enter into somebody else's experience in such a way that you end and this is a book that ends in such a way that you are not you are knocked out of true but it is an aesthetic artifact it is a novel and as a novel it has a social function it's reliant on the idea of a human community of a reading community with shared values and ideas and what we know, unfortunately, is the world the book describes is one that, oh, sorry, uh, I should put trigger warning, <laughs> apocalyptic novel. <laughs> I'm sure most of you do know that this is a novel about climate change, but it's not uh, a novel about climate change in a, in a vulgar uh, sense. What John Dos Passos called preachment. It's a very subtle, mannered, melancholy, and psychologically acute vision of what a changed world might look, la look like through a domestic prison. So it employs, it pulls all the levers of the novel as we know it. The only problem is it describes a world, and I think with terrifying plausibility, and the only other book that I've read in uh, recent times that does anything like this is uh, the, the Bone Clocks earlier this year, where you have another novelist actually saying, what does the world look like in 2034? How does the mechanism of human society in the West wind down? And the answer is, it's not a bang. It's a whimper. And then there's a point of criticality in which all of those systems, which we take for granted, which sustain us, suddenly don't operate anymore. What is it to be a social being in such a world? I think the great achievement of Clade 
is James' willingness, his courage, his uh, imaginative vision. Uh, and, and James would be the first to say this is not a, a work of speculative fiction. It hews very closely to what we know and what we might project about what will happen next. But it's only a man who actually has read widely and thought hard about what might happen who could create a world with that plausibility. It feels real. And that is why, while I was reading it, I kept on pulling my phone out of my pocket and looking at <laughs> photographs of my children <laughs> and saying, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Because at the heart of James's book, which is beautiful and sad and full of the kind of care that we all know that he possesses as a human being, there is a sense that we have... Um, we have a responsibility for the fact that we have brought into the world new generations, even though we know on some level this is not necessarily the ideal or sensible thing to do. Walter Benjamin said that there is no document of civilization that is not simultaneously a document of barbarism. Having read James's novel, I think that we should retool that. There is no document of culture that is not simultaneously a document of nature. We have lived for a long time under a kind of illusion that we live separately to nature, that we are immune to the wider world. And technology has been tremendous in helping us live a mediated existence. What this book, and the reason why I think it's very beautiful and also very important, is that it tears down that boundary. Yes, our stories, our narratives are only explicable as social experiences, as information about relationships between people that occur over time, but at the same time, we've entered a new phase, the Anthropocene, in which our own activities shape everything. There is no dividing line anymore. How do we interrogate this? Well, James, in this I think it's, a, it's, it's an extraordinary book in that it manages to walk the tightrope between those two worlds. We remain social creatures, but we are implicated in everything that the wider world can throw at us, will throw at us. So it seems to me that what we're at here with Clade is the beginning of a conversation that is no longer artificially mediated, which doesn't see an artificial distinction between culture and nature. This seems a large claim to make because I think we should return to the fact that it is a tender and closely framed domestic novel, despite the fact that it unfolds over decades, that it projects itself hugely into the future. It has a human dimension which is never gainsaid and never stepped away from. And I think to be able to marshal your material like that is something to be treasured. And it's evidence, I think, of a superior novelistic talent. So it's a great thrill and an honour to launch Clade. And I wish it well, Frailbach. Thank you.